Well, thanks so much uh, for those of you who stuck around to hear me uh, talk tonight. And uh, indeed, the, the snappy title, which I was told to give, is uh, the skinny on neuromuscular. I, have, I often don't like snappy titles, but I was coerced a little bit. Um, and I'll tell you why that, that title is in a minute. Um, I wanted to start off to say, uh, you, you've already sort of heard, I didn't put a collaborator slide. I think I'd like to, to mention, though, that the, the other physicians in the neuromuscular clinic, uh, both at, at Children's and at, at uh, Barnes would be the people I'd like to mention. Alan Pestronk, who runs a really a world-renowned neuromuscular disease center here uh, that brings in patients from all over uh, the country, sometimes the world, uh, and Ann Connolly, Paul Gollenbeck, who are the pediatric uh, neuromuscular people who really helped me in this project, and, and you'll see why. Um, and then the other, of course, I'll mention in a minute, is that, that I, was, I was a faculty scholar. So this wasn't uh, you have to do this one thing with this money type of award. It was uh, we bet that you're going to do good things for, for kids. And, and um, so it's not going to be, I'll focus a bit on some specific experiments and interesting examples, but it's an overall direction where we're going with this project and what we think it really uh, is capable of. So what are inherited neuromuscular diseases? You know, in, in general, I think uh, people understand this in, in the context of, of Jerry's kids, et cetera, uh, muscular dystrophies, inherited nerve diseases. Um, they're any genetic disease, I'll say, that affects nerve or muscle, and they usually present in childhood. Uh, the vast majority of them with weakness and, and difficulty walking. Um, depending on how you look at this, it's either very common or very rare. It depends on what diseases you study. But it, uh, the point is that they are certainly very um, disabling diseases. Uh, they're progressive, and they very frequently lead to premature death. Um, and at this point, I would say across the board, and I'll talk about a lot of different diseases, there really are no effective disease-altering therapies available. Uh, and so there's a lot of work that we have to do. Uh, this is me last year when I had hair at the neuromuscular, um, actually the muscular dystrophy uh, camp with a, a friend of mine, Brady, who has spinal muscular atrophy, um, shrinking of the muscles. He can't really walk, uh, and this is a progressive disorder that, that most uh, are diagnosed in childhood and don't live uh, beyond the third decade. Um, he is a really good wheelchair soccer player. I think we hope that he could be a really good real soccer player at some point. Um, so to kind of go over the anatomy and why neuromuscular is together, I think a lot of people think of muscle diseases and nerve diseases, it's really a circuit. And you have uh, neurons that are in the spinal cord that then uh, extend processes out, uh, out to the muscles and then cause them to twitch. And so some examples of sort of what we see are, are diseases of the neuron in the spinal cord. And there's a very common disorder called spinal muscular atrophy. That's what Brady has. Uh, that causes the shrinkage of the muscles. Now, it's not because there's something wrong with the muscles. It's because that the nerves going into the muscles uh, actually degenerate. Uh, another example that, that we study and see patients for uh, is called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease, because people like to name things after neurologists sometimes. And, and that really is of the, the projections of these same nerves going to the muscles tend to be damaged. And in fact, what you can see is that there is shrinking of the muscles, just like there is with Brady. It's happening all over the place. Here. Uh, it's happening in the longest nerves in the body, so in the feet and in the hands. And this can be, although not life-threatening typically, because it doesn't affect the respiratory muscles, it's severely disabling. And then the last one, of course, is, is the end of the circuit, is the muscles, and, and this is muscular dystrophy. Um, and this is a little guy with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is where whatever the gene product is going abnormal is causing the muscle to just primarily degenerate. And even though the nerves going into it are trying to function, uh, they can't. And so, in a way, these all present similarly, but they represent a broad spectrum of different uh, systems that are abnormal. So what do we do when someone comes to the clinic and we try and make a genetic diagnosis? Well, we see the patient. We, we do a history and physical, and we uh, look at a family history if it's available. And we do a lot of, of ancillary studies, electrical studies of the nerves. Sometimes we'll do a biopsy, and you can see sort of six cells in this example of a patient who actually has a, a type of muscular dystrophy. And then we'll throw them into a category. And we'll say, we think this person has muscular dystrophy or spinal muscular atrophy. And that's the clinical diagnosis. And then, of course, what we'd like to do is go to direct gene sequencing and identify exactly which disorder they have. Um, unfortunately, right now, the success rate for this is quite low. 
Uh, overall, it depends on, on which disease you have. It turns out for some of the more common types, mainly because the biopsy is, uh, findings are so specific, we can say that corresponds to a certain gene. But for other diseases, hereditary nerve diseases, other types of muscular dystrophy, and there's a whole series of other names for these things, the diagnosis rate is very low. And we really need to improve this. And we're actually right at the cusp of being able to do that very well because of the rapid changing and sequencing technology. And so one other reason, of course, and, I, and it, we can't do this is because we don't know all the genes that are abnormal in these diseases. And that's critically important because of this kind of diagram. And this is what you've heard a little bit about, I'm sure, already, depending on which talk you went to. But this is the kind of model that we use, is we take the patients and we try and identify what the gene disorder is. Uh, if we do that, we can then model this disease, either in a dish or in mice. We can use that information uh, to then try and do either drug screening or candidate approaches if we know what's going on and bring it back to the patients. And that's, of course, the, the whole point. And so to start out, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work here that we're doing on, on this front, identifying new disease genes. So when I, cut, I came back to visit the Neuromuscular Disease Center here and I went to a clinic and I, it was a, it's a crazy day, uh, the one at Barnes. Bo both of them are, the one at Children's. You know, you see just tons of patients coming in. And I, I thought, you know, I'm, going, I'm coming here. Because we saw patients that had the most uh, amazing diseases coming from all over the place. And uh, it was just a, a, a remarkable thing. As a physician, I'll, you know, you want to be able to see lots of different diseases and really understand them. And, and that's what we have here at Wash U. And now, what I did was, when I, when I started onto this project, this neuromuscular genetics project, is I looked from 98 to 2005, which is before I got here, um, if I'd gone through all the patients uh, that have these diseases and actually uh, figured out which ones we could identify the gene and which ones we couldn't, how many came through who had never de before described neuromuscular diseases? And there were 64 patients with never before described variants of CMT, the inherited nerve disease. And there were 33 that had limb girdle muscular dystrophies that had never been seen before. And another 33 that had congenital myopathies that had never been seen before. And this was in a relatively short period of time. The, unfortunately, at the time, we, did, we just weren't collecting these. So the first thing we said was, well, we need to collect these patients. And that was really the birth, it's very, very simple, of course, of, of the neuromuscular genetics project. Um, and, and that was really to just make a database of these patients. You've heard about these wonderful collections that people have for 15 years, and then you can really do something. So we're getting there. Um, we've actually done, as I said, focus collection at this point on patients who have presumed uh, genetic influence of their disease. We've got about 750 samples. These are all individuals who, who really do have some type of inherited nerve or muscle disease since about 2006. And, and what we're next looking at we do a lot of sort of standard gene analysis uh, and, and identification approaches, taking large pedigrees uh, uh, of family structures, and then identifying new genes. But the, really the next um, uh, frontier here is taking those smaller families where we don't have that power of genetics, and then using uh, newer approaches, uh, which actually Robbie Mitra is in the next room talking a little bit about, and he and I are working on this, on how to take smaller families and basically sequence all of the exons in their entire genome. So, you know, we know that sequencing your entire genome is probably in the next three to five years. Uh, in the short term, we're actually finding that we can sequence all possibly the important parts, depending on how you look at it, of the genome to find disease genes. And I think if this really works, and I'm pretty sure it will, in the next five years, these, the rates of genetic diagnosis are going to shoot way up. Um, and we're going to be looking at, you know, 95% of these. We're going to know uh, what these patients have. And that's not just true here, of course, at Wash U. That's all over the place. But I think we're in a very unique position because we have the patient population and we have the Genome Sciences Center and, and guys like Robbie Meacher who like to work with guys like me who are really going to be able to, to bring this together.